what's going to happen, and then say a few words about uh, the Mental Health Collectives project and what we're hoping to do. Um, so unfortunately, Harjit wasn't able to come today. He was going to speak about what happens when uh, you actually go through the mental health system of the state. Um, he had a last minute emergency, so hopefully we'll be able to have him in the future. Um, but that changes the structure a little bit. Um, we have Hana, who's going to speak about uh, a radical history, or a history of uh, mental, excuse me, a history of medical, uh, <laughs> <Right. laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. And Hana helps uh, start one of the chapters of the Icarus Project and has been involved in the mental health system in different ways. Um, and then we have Mickey, who's a licensed clinical psychotherapist. Unlicensed. Unlicensed. Right. Right. <laughs> and what are you going to be talking about? I'll be critiquing the medical model of mental health care and what kind of ways to be And then after that, we're just going to uh, have a few uh, suggested questions for breakout groups. Mostly, we just want people to talk to one another about what we've talked about today, issues you see. Um, and so, um, now I'll introduce what our project is. Um, and I'm just going to speak a little bit about. Can you explain the film? Oh, that's being uh, live streamed. Um, uh, we tweeted out a link earlier today. If anyone wants to see it later, it should be archived. Um, I'm also doing an audio recording right now that'll be posted online. Um, it's where we're probably on it, eBay. Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about mental health as a way to analyze oppression and also repression, and using those as anti-oppression and anti-repression tools. Um, this is by no means an exhaustive like idea of what our group wants to do. We're just at the very beginning. Um, and so if anyone has any uh, suggestions, like we're, we're here because we can't do this alone and we want your help in trying to push this conversation. So uh, we have sheets in the back that you can use to write down any topics that you're interested in seeing. Um, and we always want more people to work with us. Um, so the basic idea of the group is that we all have come together into radical communities because of damage. Um, we either see ourselves broken or those around us broken by um, capitalist society, white supremacy, racism, all of that kind of stuff. And so we think that's a really good way to um, think about our radical politics and maybe find new intersections. Um, it affects us. We, have, we experience trauma as a result of these kinds of oppression. Um, patriarchy feminizes emotion and any uh, like not cis male difference and sort of conflates it with weakness and inferiority. Uh, white supremacy has produced this legacy in which non-white bodies are consumed or incarcerated. Um, and capitalism has told us that uh, if we can't produce profits or at least produce future profit makers, then we're kind of just a surplus population. And we see it in the way homeless communities are treated and people with mental illness, less severe mental illnesses are treated, that it's a very quick change from sur surplus population to criminalized popula uh, population. Um, but even dominant classes are affected by these structures. Um, White people, rich people, cisgendered men are all continually reproduced with this pathological entitlement to their supremacy, as well as an equally pathological expectation that any other should really be aspiring to be more like them. Um, and that can have an effect on even people who want to approach the radical perspective. We're, all of this is ingrained in us, and so it's really hard to change those behaviors unless we like really specifically analyze them. Um, and so we carry these things, trauma, these, uh, I guess, part of my language, fucked up mental structures that society sort of uh, creates in us. We carry them into our organizing. Um, if we leave it unattended, we run the risk of replicating these structures. Um, 
how many times have people of color been tokenized or marginalized in movements and how alienating does that make people feel? Um, how many times have care work and emotional labor been relegated to non-male bodies? Uh, how many times have conflicts over racism and misogyny have been divided over lines of race and gender? How many times do we just let people disappear from our lives and our communities because they just couldn't take it anymore? It's a high pressure situation when you're fighting the state. And a lot of times we get involved and, I mean, all of Occupy Oakland was a really intense, high pressure situation. Um, and that's really hard to take without thinking about like, our own personal wellness. Um, and so that's like a lot to, that's a lot to contend with. Um, we think that mental health, illness, and wellness, despite being terms that actually make us kind of uneasy, are concepts we can use to think differently about how individuals and communities feed each other and how our respective communities interact. Um, we're not only interested in communities of care, also, um, it is super important for people to have and create a uh, space to process emotional responses to trauma and conflict. Um, and our group is interested in finding ways to open up these spaces and we're really interested in finding ways to defend these spaces and make sure that we can take care of ourselves without having it glossed over um, in order to get to that goal of revolution or whatever it is we're doing. Um, and so yeah, this taking care of our space, um, processing emotions, this is a political practice um, that we take very seriously, but we also think we can do more by um, talking about these concepts uh, in an intersectional fashion. So we all have different struggles that we deal with. We all have different needs. Um, there are probably as many ways to cope and to care as there are people in this room. Um, and so a lot of times when we talk about care and when we talk about self-care, it becomes very uh, internalized. What we want to do is provide access points to people to, for people to exchange information about these practices and how to better care for one another in different ways. Um, so we're not only interested in communities of care, but uh, creating careful communities. Um, from an anti-repression perspective, it's way easier for the state to let us destroy each other along these lines of internal conflicts. Um, that come up when we are in these high pressure situations and we kind of feel that the KG security culture that sort of emphasizes surveillance and distrust, um, that falls apart when you've left your phone at home and you drive to the middle of the woods and someone in your cohort is still a disruptive undercover or snitch. Um, we think it's better, uh, or another process we should put into place is building and reinforcing networks of support and trust so we can better identify and address what's really disruptive to the community as a whole and be able to better react in those situations where we feel like something's causing us to break apart. Um, as the saying goes, we need to be careful with each other so we can be dangerous together. <laughs> So, I'm a clinical psychologist, I'm not licensed yet, I'm in that process. Um, I have a tendency to speak really fast um, in public speaking, so don't hesitate to tell me to shut up and slow down. Speak up. Speak up. <laughs> so, let me first begin by acknowledging that the discussions that are going to take place today uh, may be difficult for many of us. Um, whenever talking about psychological distress or emotional anguish, it's not an easy fucking thing. Um, it's our intent to challenge the ways we think and speak about mental health. It's not our intent to critique or shame those who find value in and benefit from the medical model of mental health, which I'll largely be critiquing. By demedicalizing and depathologizing mental health, we mean removing the predominant discourse and practice of mental health care from the medical model in which it's currently situated and placing it in biological, psychological, social, and existential context. We also aim to look at the political circumstances and oppressive structures that give rise to suffering. And although we may not cover all ground today, it's our hope to provide a safe and inclusive environment to begin this dialogue. 
I also want to emphasize that we neither deny nor shame biological determinants of mental health or the use of psychotropics, but we are encouraging a discussion that perceives emotional and psychological distress as opportunities for growth and transformation rather than a disease, disorder, or illness to be feared or silenced uh, through various prescriptive therapies that focus on the management of symptoms rather than the social context that gives rise to the symptoms. Before we can begin to speak about the importance of depathologizing mental health, we must first look at the medical model in which mental health theory and practice is situated. In doing so, I hope to highlight the presence of various capitalist principles that not only drive mental health practice, but shape our understanding of and attitudes towards mental health and illness. So the medical model asserts that disease is an organic phenomenon disrupting an organism's ability to carry out its functional purposes in a normative fashion. Conversely, health as an absence of disease is conceived as, of as a, the, the normal and uninhibited functioning of the organism. Treatment focuses on the restoration of the organ organism to normal levels of functioning and productivity. The growing medicalization of mental health theory and practice follows directly from the medical model. Such a frame largely rests on the idea that mental health and illness are organically determined and increasingly excludes other determinants of suffering. In short, the medical model of psychotherapy presupposes the mind as a tangible entity located in the brain. Through the process of reification, Mental illness is accordingly found in the functional disturbance of the personality's constitution rather than in one's relationship to the world. Within the medical model, the client is perceived to be broken and must therefore be fixed. Treatment of mental illness is rooted in and proceeds via the diagnosis of reified mental disorders. Under this model, the therapist is pressured to medicate, manage, and re-educate irrational thoughts, behaviors, and emotions of people whose suffering does not comply with social norms. In short, the medical model seeks to control and correct the unconventional behavioral manifestations of emotional anguish, a practice frequently achieved via behavioral modification and chemical intervention, methods frequently used to silence and pacify the individual. So what we find is a concealment of suffering through the illusion of eliminating psychological pain and anguish. Suffering is believed to be composed of concrete, observable behaviors impairing an individual's ability to properly function across a variety of emotional contexts, such as occupational settings, educational settings, home settings, and other social settings. Now, if we closely examine the language of diagnostic constructs, what is really considered impaired is not so much one's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but the ways in which these experiences hinder her or his ability to function productively and efficiently. Hence, nonconformity to capitalist relations is obscured as psychological functional impairment and further mystified as organically determined. It is these relational power pressures that get into and affect the consciousness of the practicing clinician without us really realizing it sometimes, thus alienating the clinician from the therapeutic situation. With its focus on remediating, remediating functional deficits, the medical model is more appropriately exposed as a model of fixing brokenness. This limits the ways in which suffering is therapeutically addressed. As consideration is restricted to symptomatic or behavioral manifestations of suffering, symptom management is employed in which a preference is given to brief, concrete, and carefully tailored prescriptive therapies that emphasize coping skills, with the goal of eliminating and controlling problem behaviors. Thus, suffering is not so much reduced as it is managed or concealed. Disguised as a way of improving one's way of being, <coughs> attacking symptoms translates to managing the client's functioning so as to return her or him to acceptable levels of productivity. In this way, the psychotherapist, no longer a healer of souls, becomes a manager of souls thereby revealing the capitalist ethos inherent in the medical model of mental health. Rather than treating the client, current mental health care pra practices serve the social power relations to which conformity of the client is demanded. The medicalization of mental health thus depoliticizes deviance. So I'm not arguing that we should ignore or neglect symptoms 
of psychological or emotional distress. Rather, on the contrary, on our end, we should give these symptoms a voice. However, to the extent that we become overly focused on the symptoms, we lose sight of the person and their lived experience. Thus, a fixation on symptom management limits our vision. It diminishes the ability to relate to the other as a person. Overattending to symptoms further leads to the selective inattention to the other aspects of a person's life world. So how then do we begin removing the predominant discourse and practice of mental health care from the medical model? I suggest first that we further draw out and expose capitalist values driving current mental health care and the ways in which the medical model is related to capitalism. Other oppressive structures inherent in the history and systems of mental health care, such as patriarchy and racism, must also be exposed. We must also redefine mental health in such a way that suits the needs of those who suffer and not the needs of the state. Those who experience psychological distress and emotional anguish should be able to define for themselves their relations to those experiences. And as Eric Fromm noted, and please excuse the gender pronouns in this quote, mental health cannot be defined in terms of the adjustment of the individual to his society, but on the contrary, that it must be defined in terms of the adjustment of society to the needs of man. Thus, we must critically challenge the ways in which Current mental health care depoliticizes and pathologizes deviance, resistance, and nonconformity. We must also challenge the ways in which we think and speak about issues of mental health. Even the word mental, again, presupposes the mind as a material entity residing in the brain. Psychological and emotional distress should not be looked upon as an illness or a disease. Rather, such experiences should be perceived as an authentic way of being in the world in and of themselves. However, this is not to deny biological substrates of more severe psychological conditions. But even in these experiences, we can find meaning and purpose without silencing the symptoms. According to Viktor Frankl, the discovery or construction of meaning within one's suffering can help people overcome and even transcend it. He proposed this comes about by the attitude we choose towards suffering. Although we may not always choose the circumstances of, of our lives, including the various determinants that give rise to suffering, one can choose her or his attitude towards suffering in such a way that facilitates rediscovering meaning, purpose, and hope. Doing so not only can not only mitigate against the development of psychological distress, but in this way, such experiences can be seen as a challenge to overcome rather than a disorder, disease, or illness to be feared or avoided. That is, such experiences can be opportunities for growth and transformation, which will not come about through the silencing of symptoms. As Kierkegaard notes, freedom's possibility announces itself in anxiety. The more profoundly she is in anxiety, the greater is the woman. So what does that mean? It means that through facing up to our emotional anguish and psychological distress, we are jerked out of our pseudo securities and are summoned to face our almost freedom and possibilities. In this respect then, anxiety, at least of the existential sort, is not irrational or a sign of pathology, but a teacher or a guide. As Kierkegaard notes, it's about learning to be anxious in the right way. Accordingly, by embracing suffering with an attitude of courage and resolve, we can find meaning and possibility within it. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Where do we find these therapists? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I've always said that finding a, a therapist that's a right match for you is one of the most difficult parts of the therapeutic process. Um, part of what we're hoping to do within the mental health working group is um, gather uh, an ever growing resource um, of um, referrals and mental health resources uh, that we can direct people to. Um, so, honestly, I. I don't know specifically the injured people, here's me. <laughs> um, but that's something that we're hoping to, uh, to address. I think there's starting to be more therapists 
coming from a radical perspective. And the, the whole field of somatic therapy is something that I find really encouraging. And there's a lot of people at um, CIIS, I think it's Integrated Studies, I can't remember the full acronym, but in the city that are studying somatic therapy. And even people that are studying how to do therapy specifically for people involved with radical struggles. There's so much happening in that area. And I think that's part of what Bread and Roses is working on. Like he said, entirely. So if you know of anybody, please uh, give us your names. Um, so what, I, what I'm saying is that uh, diagnostic constructs are their social constructions that we reify into um, organically determined diseases. Um, again, that's not to deny uh, biological determinants of uh, mental health and suffering, uh, but uh, probably the strongest force um, within uh, the mental health field um, you know, because it is, you know, within the medical model, is that um, mental health is largely um, a result of uh, chemical imbalances. Uh, there's no concrete evidence actually proving that theory. It's just a theory which is so popular that people um, uh, believe it to be true. Uh, so what I'm talking about is that we, we, we speak about, uh, say, the mind or the personality is that they actually exist. It's their concrete things that exist in the brain. Um, and diagnostic constructs or unification of the people that we're doing. So when you say that um, like those sort of organic determinants or determinants don't exist, do you mean like they aren't found in tests or just it's not known whether they're truly the cause? It's not known whether they're truly the cause. So for instance, for um, schizophrenia, the dopamine hypothesis is uh, one of the biggest ones in which there's an oversensitivity to dopamine. Um, and in clinical trials, there, you know, uh, it's found that many people with schizophrenia um, have a uh, uh, high level of, of, do of dopamine. Um, but uh, these are just theories. We've never actually proven that dopamine um, or high levels or oversensitivity to dopamine causes schizophrenia. It's just a major theory out there. Presupposes that there's a there's a mind, uh, there's a tangible entity that's located in the, in the brain, uh, and I think that although seemingly neutral, I think mental um, gives uh, reinforces the concepts of illness and disease and disorder. Uh, <clears throat> this has been an ongoing debate in more kind of radical communities of uh, psychology and psychiatry um, about how to. How, how can we better refer to it? Um, I like to just talk about psychological disorders and more tone English, because that's what it that's what it is. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about um, coping mechanisms? Sorry, can you speak louder? I don't understand a word. Sorry, guys. Please stop here. Could you talk a little bit more about coping and coping mechanisms and how? 
was getting that. So essentially, now I'm not saying that coping <laughs> skills is inherently uh, bad. What I am saying is that uh, the medical model uh, has an over-focus on symptom management that seeks to silence and manage those symptoms that run counter to the status quo. Um, and prevent one from being a productive uh, member of society or in the workforce or, and so forth. Um, so I, I, um, I, I encourage us to kind of remove ourselves from this uh, overly fixated attention towards symptoms, right? not to deny the symptoms, um, but not to silence them either. We want to look at um, uh, you know, these experiences as authentic ways of being in the world of themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so medication, although can be very useful, is one of the um, biggest ways to silence the symptoms. Um, so thought stopping techniques, referring to people's people's thoughts as irrational, um, and looking at more rational ways of thinking. Um, those are some of the coping skills and mechanisms I, I, I take issue with when we try to re-educate people about how they perceive the world without validating how they experience the world. Um, so again, I'm not saying that coping skills and symptom management is inherently bad. I'm just trying to pull it away from the ways in which um, the medical model of capitalism seeks to use these methods uh, to um, really kind of uh, silence and uh, uh, behaviors um, that uh, run kind of towards times for yeah. So the alternative route then would be to address the root of these issues, which would be social roots, I'm assuming. How in the meantime would you mitigate symptoms of people who are really suffering uh -huh. while at the same time addressing these very real because I feel like there needs to be some balance between the two to mitigate suffering mm -hmm. and also deal with this larger system of problem. Agreed, agreed. Um, so I, I say you focus on both. Right. You learn um, healthy coping mechanisms um, that help one learn uh, to decrease the intensity and frequency of symptoms that are truly troubling to them, um, while at the same time, looking at um, the underlying uh, context and issues that give rise to suffering, mm -hmm. and uh, encouraging um, the, you know, finding meaning and possibility within this. Uh, I, I, I approach um, my practice uh, very existentially, and I talk about um, how by embracing our limitations and by embracing our imperfections, we can find new possibilities within them. You were going, you were talking about um, here. Some yeah, we have some more questions right. from others. Yeah. Um, I don't know, lately I've found a lot of really, I mean, there's two sides to the, to the medical thing. And there's like a lot of really empowering stuff that's coming out of the medical model right now about average common experiences, how our whole brains are formed from zero to five, how we can I'm sorry, reverse, I didn't part. how our brains are formed from zero to five, how we can reverse the effects of average childhood experiences, people like Aramati, people who speak to um, how all these things do affect our brain and the chemicals in our brain, mm -hmm. how capitalism, too much stress affects our brains and changes our chemicals in our brains. And also like finding out really exciting things like crime is going down and that most people who are in prison are in prison because during the 60s and 70s they were exposed to lead. Um, you know, all of all of these things, and um, I just think they're they're really important. And I'm also speaking to working with people who are really suffering, who, um, you know, working with poor people, people who are, you know, subject to environmental racism, exposed to things like lead, kids who are eating petrochemicals in the diet and their food. All of that is biological, mm -hmm. and so there's a whole other side, um, you know. 
to that. And I think it's just a conflict that, you know, I'm a mental health professional, it's a conflict that can be used for, um, I agree with what you're saying, but then I have a big problem with the whole existential thing and the whole cognitive thing, and it's just how you see things, or how you perceive things, or how you change mm -hmm. your attitude, and, you know, also the whole perspective of you're talking about Victor Frankl and Eric Fromm, that's all Western, white, and middle class. Absolutely. And that's what you like to do with the people that I work with every day. So those are just some of the thoughts. And I think some of the stuff that's coming out of biology right now on the other side is really empowering that if you treat children the, um, differently. And like you have a sequester who's getting rid of Head Start, and then they find out that exposing a child to Head Start decreases their chances of going to prison later, like mm -hmm. dramatically, mm -hmm. changes their brain chemistry dramatically. And so, I mean, I think those are all like really important things to do. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you 100 um, percent. Again, I don't deny biological determinants of mental health. Um, I'm saying we need to add these, you know, we, we shouldn't focus on that to the extent that it uh, diminishes other uh, determinants of mental health and how they interact with each other. But I just read them trying to say they're not mutually exclusive, that a child should like go to Head Start and be loved and have good yeah. child care, and the fact that that changes your brain chemistry, they're both they're biologically determinants. It's also how society should be. We should have child care, children mm -hmm. should be loved, mm -hmm. they should be honored, and that has a good effect on your brain. So they're seeing the two together, they can be very helpful. And there's the other side of the anti capitalism you know, that lives differently, are to treat different chemicals and be happier. And if you're being more exposed to, like I said, um, the fact that kids are eating petrochemicals, and people don't realize this, um, you know, to me, those are things that are huge. So I don't see them usually. I think that's a really good example, actually, of the intersection of social and chemical responses, because um, a Head Start is a social issue, and that social issue, um, I mean, having that program in society, like, people have to come together to facilitate that happening. And so, um, people coming together, it ends up affecting how those uh, children, their brain chemistry develops, and I mean, there are also racist structures that facilitated people of color uh, being in communities that are much at much higher exposure to lead and stuff like that. So it's not mutually exclusive at all. You're very right. Like those are very important issues to think about. That's all. Was it that you mentioned? Oh. Dr. Mahdi, he's a, he's a physician from Canada who works with addiction. Um, he's got like tons of books out. He's on KPS all the time. And he comes from a medical model that talks about capitalism and how capitalism is the driving force for um, like parents are too stressed out and how that adversely affects you know children. And so if parents weren't so stressed out doing the things that they're dealing with in a capitalist society, you wouldn't have children who grow up a certain way who are going to be more likely to become addicts because no. And I mean, it's a, it's a really deep thing because, like, you know, as a mom, you know, um, being in some Freudian stuff, you often, even being in someone like Albert Ryan, you don't want to get blamed. Like, sometimes I listen to the whole thing about average life experiences when I fight with my husband, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm like, screw up my kid. So, I mean, you, go to, you know, you can look at this in so many um, different ways. It's just that, and like, what you were speaking to, it did speak to, like, the kind of that I know that I'm working with. I graduated from CIS. I sort of spoke more to, like, private practice CIS than for people of color. But I work with, and they do deal with some of them that are um, problematic. Um, and I totally agree with you about, and I don't want to you know, hijack the whole thing, and I totally agree with you in some ways, but I mean, and you just, there's some things that people are having problems. Like, you don't want people to, like, you know, wind up going to jail and, you know, become addicts and, you know, do violent things, um, or, or be suicidal, or, and I find that so many of those things are driven by stress and lack of resources, is what I deal with. Absolutely, and then that kind of brings us back to some of the repressive structures that um, create that distress. So I, I, I can agree with you. I think that was a really awesome discussion to end that part on. Is everyone, anyone, other questions? Don't want to shut anyone out. Can you explain somatic therapy? Um, probably somebody else could explain it better than me, but I know that somatic means the body. So seeing, um, like for example, if you were going to talk about PTSD, 
that it would somatic like a somatic approach would be that you store trauma in your body so that you have to like pay attention to where that's at. And it's not it's not just about you know talk therapy. It's going to be an interaction between mental and physical. I don't know. Somebody else might want to speak to that. I think that pretty much captures it. It's kind of how we body more from our Sorry, um, I think that pretty much captures it. I think it's kind of about how we body forth our, our English uh, distress. Rosen is, is a really good example. You know Rosen? I'm sorry, I was going to talk about Rosen, the Rosen method. Is I'm not familiar with it. Oh, okay, well, it's a hands on connecting, connecting body with emotional. With emotional um, stress parts of the body that react back to the thing. It's been developed over about 40 years. Um, I can't go into it a lot because I don't know a lot about it. But I've had plenty of it's so many things. That's the main thing. And it's the name of it is Rosie. Thank you. To keep things moving, uh, let's have Hannah talk now. And just a reminder, we will have time for more conversation afterwards. Uh, it sounds like we have a lot of good. So, um, I'm going to use historical examples to ask the question, can mental health struggles become offensive again? And um, I'm pretty much just going to read what I wrote. Sorry, I'm not used to public speaking. Um, uh, thanks to Brett and Moses for putting on this panel. <laughs> So I want to ask the question, can mental health struggles become offensive again? By offensive, I mean directly attacking the systems of oppression that have caused these struggles to become necessary in the first place. <laughs> Building alternatives to mental health and industrial complex is something we need to do. We have to take care of one another in this way, reappropriating the master's tools which work for us into horizontal and communal structures while developing, experiencing, and reclaiming our own tools of healing. <coughs> Learning how to effectively advocate is needed because we're going to interact with the mental health industrial complex, whether directly ourselves or with comrades, whether it's experienced as a force that is wholly oppressive or has healthy aspects. So can mental health struggles become offensive again? I say make these struggles offensive again because they have been so in the past. And I'm going to look at three main historical examples in this context. Um, the first is the radical psychiatric practice of France Fanon. Um, the struggle to have homosexuality removed from the DSM as a psychiatric disorder. And finally, the actions of the Socialist Patients Collective. Before exploring those, I want to make some historical points about the history of mental health as it relates to the rise of capitalism. Could you also speak up? Yeah. In the 17th century in Europe, a great confinement occurred. Hospitals were built along with prisons. However, their purpose was not treatment, but to exercise power and social control. The mad began to be locked up along with others who were considered social deviants. Criminals, the insane, and unemployed were all seen as idle, and this was a threat to the reorganization of society along market principles. Once confined, these people would be made to work. This basic idea carried into the 18th century with the addition of police power to aid in the confinement. In the late 19th century, Freud came onto the scene and psychoanalysis dominated well into the 20th century. In the 60s and 70s, the anti-psychiatry movement and then the ex-patients movement came into being, and the mental health system was under attack for being abusive, authoritarian, and unscientific. Patients, psychiatrists, and sociologists questioned the idea that psychoanalysis can impose a uniform idea of sanity that was more valid than individual experience and freedom, and fought to stop involuntary hospitalization and high doses of drugs and convulsive and psychosurgical procedures. In 1980, the Third Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, DSM-3, was published with much fanfare as a tool that would make psychiatry more objective and scientific. What it did was solidify the biochemical model of psychiatry. This model took the stance that mental illness comes from the chemical imbalances of the brain, rather than allowing for the possibility that our distress could come from social or political causes. 
At that time, neoliberalism also took hold with the support of the pharmaceutical industry. This model became the accepted form of mental health treatment, as Mickey was talking about. In this way, the radical movements of the 60s and 70s were recuperated. The Icarus Project, mainstay of the current radical mental health movement, was founded in 2002 as a website where people could gain some autonomy over their mental health, and it's geared towards people coming from a radical perspective. Many local Icarus Project chapters or support groups have come into being since then, collectively challenging the dominant idea that our social and political environments, not to mention the economic system, are irrelevant from our mental health. So, to turn to my main example, starting with Fanon. Throughout this history, pockets of offensive action have occurred. I'm sure that many have gone undocumented and that I've left out important ones. Um, so beginning with Franz Fanon, who's a French Algerian psychiatrist and revolutionary. He blurred the boundaries, he blurred the boundaries between medicine and politics, believing that to be mentally healthy, one has to be part of a healthy social context. He promoted violent revolution as the best or only road to social and mental wellness. He was personally involved in the Algerian Revolution of 1954 to 1962, Algeria having been brutally occupied by the French colonialists. In his book, A Dying Colonialism, Fanon discussed doctors who became active colonists and settlers dispossessing native land, informing on patients about gunshot wounds, and even serving as torturers by re reviving patients for further torture. He saw Algerians <coughs> being removed from France to be inmates at mental hospitals there, and he saw the effects of colonialism on his patients in Algeria. <coughs> he also treated French colonialists, and so he came to understand their dynamics. He saw the workers at his hospital firing, firing for engaging in a general strike and joined the revolutionary struggle as an extension of his practice. It can be said from this limited analysis that Fanon's strategy was largely successful. Algeria was liberated and he produced a prolific amount of writing that is incredibly useful to radicals today. His decolonization perspective on mental health can inform our struggles, cutting in many different directions, from revolutionary action as treatment, to understanding the psych psychological effects of colonization, to critiquing methods of psychiatric treatment that come from a Euro-American egocentric perspective. We can look at the individual-focused Western therapy within the U.S., which contains a manifest destiny logic, obscuring the bigger picture of the web of interrelatedness of family, ancestors, other living beings, etc., which are some of the hallmarks of indigenous worldviews. Or we can see how psychiatric practices have been brought to bear in the war on terror, both to aid in torture or to characterize the other. Modern psychiatry continues to be a tool of colonization, Having a decolonial analysis alone, however, would not make a mental health struggle offensive. On the contrary, it could easily lead to the kind of diversity sensitivity reforms which benefit the recuperative tendencies of capitalism. It could be very useful, however, for radical advocacy projects and for creating alternatives. So, um, turning to the next example of the DSM and homosexuality. In May 1970, hundreds in the anti-psychiatry movement joined gay activists in forming a human chain barring psychiatrists from entering the American Psychiatric Association's annual meeting. During a similar disruption the following year, gay activist Frank Comney grabbed the podium and declared war on psychiatry for its DSM classification of homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder. Wanting the protests to stop, the APA formed a task force which officially deleted homosexuality as a mental illness in 1973. So this was a highly successful strategy, and also an instance of mental health being strengthened by linking up with another struggle. In fact, they were mutually beneficial. These struggles seem to have more potential to become offensive when linked with other movements, even mass movements. For instance, the women's liberation movement of the 60s and 70s largely embraced their mad sisters. Psychoanalytic feminism basically turned Freud's theories on their head and used them to undermine patriarchy and the concept of genders as biological. Here's a quote from Off Our Backs, a woman's radical 1970s periodical. Quote, I feel that one of the jobs of radical women's therapy is to fight the notion of mental sickness and mental health. Because women have the experience of being put down, belittled, and oppressed in many ways, we share poor self-image. This, however, does not qualify us as sick. Today, women have been and are currently disproportionately affected by the mental health system. 
We are more likely to be offered diagnosis, to be given meds, and to suffer the consequences within the system, such as being defined an unfit mother, not being able to make decisions about our legal affairs, being denied health insurance, or losing our jobs as a result of diagnostic record keeping. There is a lot of potential to link up with feminist as well as anti-racist struggles. One example was the Federal Violence Initiative of the 1990s that aimed at identifying inner city children with alleged defects that would make them violent when they reached adulthood. It was aimed at children of color by the National Institute of Mental Health, which is a publicly funded government agency. According to the website of Movement of Mothers Standing Up Together, the research plans are still in operation which involves searching for a violence gene, by, um, finding biochemical imbalances and intervening in the lives of school children with psychiatric drugs. Additionally, Native Americans are more likely to be diagnosed than any other ethnicity. So there are myriad potentials for making connections with multiple movements. Okay, turning to the next example, um, Socialist Patients Collective. This was an anarcho-Marxist group in the 1970s in Germany, which started out as a patient and student occupation, members of which allegedly went on to engage in armed struggle in the Red Army faction. SPK was formed by a group of patients and students and Dr. Wolfgang Huber at Heidelberg, Heidelberg University in 1968. The catalyst occurred when Huber was fired at, as head of the university clinic for not going along with conservative practices of the psychiatric department. The patients held a general assembly to discuss on the one hand their treatment as human guinea pigs and on the other the ways in which they were denied treatment or made to leave the clinic without an explanation. They barricaded the assembly from press and clinic staff. After Huber was fired, SBK formed um, and occupied the administrative buildings beginning a hunger strike. It was successful, and they were able to take space in which to try out different modalities of healing and to develop their analysis. They decided that, quote, capitalist performance of the Federal Republic was sick within itself and was thus producing mentally sick people, which could only be changed by violent revolution. They believed capitalism created mental illness and labeled them as unproductive uh, and a patient class. They carried out additional occupations demanding that SDS be allowed on campus, that's the Students for Democratic Society, um, and that they be allowed to keep the ground they had gained, which was constantly under attack. At one point, the university actually voted to have SDK officially made a separate institution within the university, but there was division with staff and faculty, and this wasn't carried out. They looked at illness as a weapon, and the leading cadres of SVK linked their theoretical reflections with the creation of therapeutic working circles centered on explosives, radio communications, photography, surveillance, and self-defense techniques. Their activities included university occupation, setting fire to a state psychiatric clinic, attempting to bomb a train carrying um, the president of Fexero Republic, which I guess is like a CEO, or something. shooting police and robbing a bank. Later, members affiliated with RAF allegedly kidnapped diplomats in exchange for political prisoners, including Bader and Meinhof. Their demands were not met, and they shot two military attaches. Other hostages were released, though SPK and RAF members were injured. Some killed in an accidental explosion, while others were captured and tried. Many of them ended up in prison. There's not a lot of source material on SPK, and they definitely get low marks for communication skills. Many of their documents are more or less incomprehensible, um, so it's not easy to analyze their actions. The kidnapping of the diplomats was, however, a massive fail. Um, they didn't get their comrades released, their hostages. Hostages as well as militants were killed by mishandling of bombs, and they got caught. So, um, one can't advocate for the use of their tactics, but there may be some useful application of their analysis. If capitalism, and I would widen this to include other forces of oppression, such as white supremacy, patriarchy, heteronormativity, cause our mental illness, can we heal through collective action, and might this lead to offensive struggle? Some of their tactics could possibly be useful, um, adapted to the present, including self-defense collectives and occupations. Self-defense because it builds skills that would physically and psychically prepare for offensive struggle, and occupations because of the need for space to develop a movement. In conclusion, I'd like to briefly go back to the tactic of advocacy and see where the potential for linking to offensive struggles um, is within this. 
Advocacy can be seen as reform at its worst, but radical in terms of the Black Panther concept of survival pending revolution, or from another angle, the revolution in everyday life, where in the maintenance of autonomy, getting needs met, taking up space, and surviving despite the odds can be seen as radical in and of itself. Direct action casework, which is combining legal work with disruptive action, could also be useful. Ontario Coalition Against Poverty is probably the best known example of this, and it has been wildly successful at getting people um, welfare or public housing that they have a right to, but are being denied. It can be critiqued for being limited to enforcing the law and not be, being initiated by the people affected. One member of the movement of mothers standing up together, which I mentioned before, used the tactic of a hunger strike to get her son released from involuntary hold in Washington state. And this is a situation which may also have benefited from the additional tactic of disruption. These tactics have been used successfully to help individuals, but the system remains intact. Much of the power of the mental health industrial complex relies on record keeping um, and power accumulation through accumulating records and knowledge about people. As I spoke of earlier regarding people getting denied health insurance because of their diagnosis or declaration of incompetency. Perhaps collective action could be brought to bear um, on this practice or the actual records themselves. To bring this to a personal example, I've had my analysis of gender oppression pathologized. I have a record that states that I'm psychotic because I have irrational anger at all men. This is an example. Um, <laughs> lastly, I'd like to say that working towards collective offensive action needn't preclude individual healing work. There's a tension between the two, but I think they can meet and inform one another. A few years ago, I was at an anarchist conference in Berkeley and saw members of the Void Collective from Greece. They emphasized friendship and community as key to health in building a sense of revolutionary power. Someone asked how to heal from the trauma of state violence, and the answer was, action dries your tears. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we can go out on a limb here, but I feel like it's important personally for me to say that. that. 
to say, I think I'm going to go out on a limb here to say this, but it's pretty important for me personally. Um, in the past, facing my own forms of depression, what I have found to be intrinsically helpful has been um, forgiveness and compassion. And that's something that is not talked a lot about. Um, action oftentimes means um, using your anger and going back out there, getting back in there and like working with your anger, which is important to like recognize that. It's something for me I've noticed to be able to move past that and to actually heal my trauma has been to forgive. And I know that is such a huge like, oh it's so easy to say that, but it's been so vital for me to be able to do that. Yeah, just in response to that, I think that yeah, I don't hear people talk about forgiveness much, but that forgiveness, I think, is for the person who's suffering with the anger, and it doesn't mean that you'll excuse whatever happened to you. Like, it has nothing to do with that. Because, so what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. If I could just comment on that. I think that the language of forgiveness and of compassion for your oppressor is something that's used against women and people of color a lot. That, you know, you need to stop being so angry and you need to calm down and you need to forgive, and it's, it's really, really often a colonialist and a patriarchal oppressive theme. So I think that, like, you know, ask, like, like you were saying, it's, it's something you can ask of yourself, but I think even to say, you know, this is something that's really helped me, maybe it would help you, is almost legalist in a way, because it's like, you need to get over yourself. And frankly, I don't think we need to get over patriarchy and racial oppression. I don't think it's I think the idea that you need to dry your tears and get into action is part of what, like, that's part of what Bread and Roses is all about, is that, that those things are not, like, like, grieving about stuff and dealing with trauma is not opposed to, like, being on the street, that those things can be together. Mm -hmm. And that, um, I mean, actually, when I was at that conference and I heard that comment, my react, the re initial reaction was one of anger. Like, I can't just do that, you know? But now, three years later, I'm able to hear that and feel it and, like, own it. Um, but I also, I mean, just speaking to, like, as somebody who's been in the street and had a complete panic attack meltdown and had to learn ways of dealing with stuff, like, there's really easy things you can do that they do, you know, in psych wards. Like, one thing is being able to just hold ice cubes, like, to feel like a physical grounding thing that's gonna change. How you're, how you're physically feeling in the moment. Um, I don't know, there's a lot There's a lot of tricks. Like, this is a weird one, but kind of like, if you can count backwards from 100 by sevens, because when you're in panic attack, it's like this older part of your brain is taking over, and so if you can derail it to do mental math, it sounds weird, but it actually works, <laughs> at least in the moment. Um, this young lady was talking about she was getting advice about how to get over her, her uh, the reaction she had with her with that uh, police experience, and we're all talking we're all talking about you know things you can do, and I think to me it's worth following back to what she said because I think that that the grief the grief group had already established this mutual way of dealing with each other with friendship. Um, and giving really bad psychological advice isn't the same, isn't that. But a lot of cases, like our, our small community, our social support systems are the ones that can provide reassurance that like we are safe, that we, we can heal from trauma, that we can build the life we want to have in the world. And then I think that that ability should not be diminished. Um, I don't, I don't reject uh, seeking any sort of help from someone who's received training, from someone who's inside the medical model, outside the medical model, an elder, any of those things, but I think I, something that's really important to me personally is empowering us all to say that we all have experiences with trauma of varying strikes, and we all have ways that we have healed, and we have all have ways we have uh, continued to keep surviving. And so to kind of balance those things. And I think that 
in my own life, um, there has been this fear of, of giving bad, bad advice. And I think that that's a legitimate fear, that you don't want to be damaging to someone in your community who you care very much about. But I also don't want to be so afraid of reaching out that I further the isolation that someone's experiencing. Um, and so I think, it, I think it is a mix. And I think that, for me, it always goes back to this idea of friendship, of family, of small community. Um, that are the ones that can provide support, and then an idea of a larger political or social community that can tell a story that this thing that happened to you is wrong, that police violence is wrong, that white supremacy is wrong, and not seeing those two forces as things that work in opposition, but things that work together to allow us to heal trauma. Thing than supporting people in the wider community. 